Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next EDW session. We are uh, in a session called The Most Common MDM Business Case Mistake and How to Avoid It, which is presented by Bill O'Kane, the VP and MDM strategist at Prophecy. All audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window to the right of the screen, and our speaker will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. We also want to note that there is a linked form at the bottom of this page where audience members are able to leave evaluations for the session, and we'd really appreciate it if you were able to to do that. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you and welcome, Bill. Okay, thanks, Natalie, and thanks everybody for joining uh, and for your time today. Uh, this is actually my favorite topic, uh, the most common MDM business case mistake and how to avoid it. And uh, for those that don't know, prior to joining Prophecy about a year and a half ago, uh, I led Gartner's MDM and data governance practice for eight years. I was the lead author and creator of the current version of the Magic Quadrant for MDM. I uh, decided to make a change and, and decided to join Prophecy a couple of years ago as, as a sort of a leading MDM vendor in the space. Um, the reason I bring that up is just because the reason I'm so confident in saying what I'm about to say is that after about a half dozen pretty successful MDM implementations uh, before that, uh, at Prophecy, I had a documented 3,000 client interactions of 30 minutes or more over eight years. They actually track that, so that's how I know. Uh, and this particular topic, took up about 80% of those interactions easily. And Prophecy still interacts with Gartner as an MDM vendor. And so we check with them pretty regularly. And they've told us that this proportion of this problem showing up or this issue showing up or this request showing up over the past couple of years since I've left is still consistent. So you know, they're happy to have anybody talk about it. Um, inside or outside of Gartner at this point. So uh, again, this is why I, how I formulated this. Uh, I didn't make a point of making slides about how it comes about, but it's, it's a very, very common thing. You've probably heard it before. This is just sort of a really strong version of it. If you're already encountering this, you're gonna get a lot of confirmation and suggestions. Uh, they won't all be easy to implement, but uh, certainly if you can sort of have the catharsis that this is meant to bring about uh, at some point during it, uh, during the session, then you'll you'll certainly find this helpful. Just move forward. There we go. So, out of all those thousands of interactions and the half dozen programs I worked on, uh, some 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 sort of seemingly sensible trends and reasons for doing things like MDM and governance and data management. Uh, always seem to rear their heads over and over again. And they seem pretty logical. And we'll get into some specifics about the, what they are. And I've seen really, really smart people, some of the smartest people I've ever met, actually make these mistakes. Uh, and if they don't stay on top of the programs they're in charge of, they actually revert back to those mistakes if they don't take an active role in steering people away from them. So why should you care about this? Well, there's there's some very good reasons. If, you, if we do just a few sort of non-intuitive, they're not... They're not rocket science. They're fairly simple. They're just sort of difficult to implement, even though they are simple. Uh, and they're habits that you, that you have to sort of, uh, habits and levels of fortitude that you have to develop in these programs, which can take a while, as we all know. Uh, why, should you, why should you do them? They help you maximize delivery of business benefits. And the dirty secret is uh, you end up doing less work, OK? So, you know, this isn't all about getting everything done. In fact, that's one of the mistakes is trying to do everything. The people use the cliche, boil the ocean. Uh, that's certainly something that comes up and it comes up as a result more of what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so if you can do uh, what I talk about here, it'll naturally sort of lead to not boiling the ocean and delivering uh, value very, very quickly. Uh, something we're pretty fanatic about at Prophecy, which is one of the reasons I, I joined. Uh, again, you avoid unnecessary effort and expense. In, in effect, you don't clean up data that, that's not really going to add any value. And you'll be able to prove what you did. Uh, that's another thing uh, that often happens is you do something very good. It's, it's not out front because you're managing the data layer in the back. And you just never really get the sort of uh, political capital that you need to keep moving uh, in an effective way. So hopefully this helps with that as well. Some, some guy at Gartner was quoted over and over again as having said this years ago, and it's still true. Um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good number still. Uh, by failing, we mean, you know, when MDM fails, it fails. It's not like when a data warehouse fails and it's there and nobody decides to use it. They keep doing what they're doing. MDM, when it fails, doesn't get installed, doesn't get put into production, uh, doesn't get fully modeled and populated. Um, 
And when they fail, it's you. The biggest reasons are again because they've been justified by things that sound right, and they're actually are they are technically correct, but they have a fatal flaw in them that we'll get to. And that flaw causes one of two things, and even this is not really intuitive. The first thing that happens, I, I like to say this uh, sometimes in certain situations, there are two bad things that happen when you go for funding for MDM. The second worst is actually you get you get kicked out of the room and, and you don't get funding. That's the second worst. Someone says, you know, uh, we're talking to an ERP or a CRM vendor and they say if we buy it and just install it and get some data into it, uh, our revenue is going to go up 15%, our costs are going to go down 25%. Um, may or may not even be accurate. It may be accurate. It may not be. But you don't get paid. You don't get any money. And they say, come back next year. We'll talk about this again. Uh, we're not comfortable with it. That kind of thing. Keep talking to us. It sounds interesting, but we don't want to do it right now. That's the second worst thing. The absolute worst thing is you get funding for one year and you justify it in the ways we're going to talk about today. And eventually someone's going to say, what did I get for all that? And I had clients say things to me in the past, like at, at Gartner as an analyst, uh, you know, I heard my, I got asked what business value I added and I heard myself respond with data architecture. And I knew I needed to call someone because I knew that wasn't going to be very helpful to me or to anyone. Um, even though everything I was saying was correct, I could tell by the looks on the faces that I was kind of done for a while in terms of getting any additional funding to complete what I want to do. And these things, I've seen them go 80, 85% complete and have this problem and literally get stopped dead until another funding round where somebody can give whoever this is some advice as to sort of what went wrong, even though they did everything right. The idea is to have this discussion before, again, before you get any funding and before you spend it. Uh, I like to say this, you will have this discussion, the one I'm about to describe. You will have it. It's just best to have it before you spend any money uh, because again, it'll keep your scope down. It'll, it will ensure that you have buy-in, not so much get you buy-in, but show you whether you have it or not, or you need to do more work. Uh, because eventually, uh, if you don't have this discussion now, a year later, when you go back, or maybe sooner, someone will say, gee, you know, what, am I, what did I get for all that? Uh, what you want to say is, what will we get for all this? What is it you want out of this? Um, and there's some logic uh, to not, people always say to me, how do I sell MDM? I would say more than half the organizations I dealt with shouldn't be selling MDM to their business at all. Uh, I, I use the analogy, if you decided as an IT architect that you needed uh, an enterprise service bus to stop doing a lot of point integrations because they were counterproductive, would you explain that to the business? How far would you go? And of course, it's not very far. Uh, and I like to say, you know, think about this. You're doing that with data because you think everybody understands that. When in fact, the way we're talking about data in this context is just as infrastructure centric as that enterprise service bus, bus I described. You know, somebody will see the the direct results of it because they will see the cleaner, more trusted data when you're done, but they don't really understand the idea of how you're trying to get there. And it may or may not be a mistake to try to bring them to that understanding. I like to say, you know, the best MDM project I ever worked on was called New Account Opening for the 21st Century. The business had no idea we were doing MDM. All they knew was on that Monday morning when we went live, here's what was going to happen. If they tried to enter a duplicate, a pop-up window would come up and ask them if they really wanted to do it and make suggestions and things like that. That's what they cared about. They had no idea what master data management was. And had I tried to explain it, I'm sure I would have been fired. So again, just to, just to reiterate the problem, you know, the failure to use a structured framework, I believe that we actually did a survey of prophecy that these are quotes from, fosters ratification of the financial benefits. And ratification is a critical thing that I'll get to as well. And, it, and you know, failure to do this often leads to program failure. Our own surveys show that almost two thirds of MDM projects, no matter, no matter what vendor or if there's no vendor at all, uh, failed to go beyond piloting and experimentation. And there are a number of reasons for that. But one is, you know, this looks very big. Uh, no one's going to pay for this over the, the, the long haul. And the idea is the long haul is not really necessary. So common dysfunctional business outcomes. I said people say things that are logical uh, and even correct, and they just don't work over the long haul. Better data quality. So when I would get uh, sessions with people while at Gartner, uh, I would ask them when they would say, you know, we're about to fail. I can't get any more, no more funding. I, I did all the things I said I would do. My project plan looks complete for phase one. Uh, something's wrong. I, I'm, I'm not at the top of the stack of prioritizations anymore. 
Um, and I would always start the same way. Tell me what you said the benefits of this would be uh, last year when you when you campaigned for funding. And in, cre in order of increasing frequency and popularity, here are the answers I would get. They were always up the same, one of the same four or two. Better data quality, better decisions, single version of the truth. This is usually where people start to feel like uh, I'm getting personal with them because it's getting more frequent. And finally, 360 degree view of something, and it's usually the customer. Sometimes it's product, but usually it's the customer. And these are all great things. They're all things we should strive for, but they don't make a good business case. Uh, if you spend 500,000 or three quarters of a million or a million dollars or heaven forbid even more uh, over a year and someone comes back to you and says, what are we getting out of this again? If you say any of these, you're probably going to have a tough week or month or year. Uh, and I speak from experience and again, talking to just thousands of people. These are great things. They, they are things to strive for. Absolutely. I call them sometimes architectural goals. Uh, but they are not business reasons to undertake data governance or MDM or d even data management in general. There's also a new one in the bunch. Uh, monetize our data. Uh, very forward thinking. This is a great thing. I, I've been, I was involved in a program to monetize data in 1995 that went pretty well uh, from a data warehouse. And uh, so I certainly appreciate this. I think it's great. It's a great way to judge the value of what you're doing. But again, if, that, if you don't have specific business use cases of who you're going to sell it to and what you're going to sell them and why they should buy it, uh, this is just as bad as the others, better data quality, better decisions, 360 view, single version of truth, or even worse, because nobody really knows what this is as much as they know what the other four are. Uh, so if this is the only thing you're hanging your hat on, um, and I'm going to come up with an exception that's based on this in a little while. Uh, again, you're just increasing your risk. And again, I, I want to say, I would never say to anyone, if you do X, you're going to fail. Uh, we're talking about decreasing risk here and decreasing workload and, and decreasing risk by decreasing the workload uh, that you have to, have to model, have to manage, have to implement in order to deliver value. So just a quick... Uh, Saying here, cliche, means to an end is not the same thing as the end. That's a brief way of saying all of what I'm about to say. So how do you recognize a real business outcome? This is a great trick that I came up with years ago. Uh, it trips up a lot of people that appear to be uh, or th that believe they're on the right track. Try to state why you're doing all of this or want to do all of this and don't use the word data. Now, I said I'd, there'd be an exception for data monetization. If you're in the business of monetizing data uh, and selling data, or trading data, then this doesn't apply to you, that you're gonna have business cases with the word data in them. Uh, so it might be a little trickier for you to, to see to see one that may not be great, but you can use the word data. If So what do I mean when I say this? Things like this, I wanna hear sort of operational and analytical metrics uh, that again, don't really use the word data. That it's It's a trick of the trade to, sort of help you avoid the mistakes of the previous slide. If you force yourself to try to do this, uh, it becomes, uh, it does a lot of other things for you in terms of mindset and the people you're dealing with on the business as well. If you can't do this, I, I hope this isn't too melodramatic. We have a huge red flag. And I say that from, again, talking to thousands and thousands of people about this, who, you know, some said, I wish I could go back because this was the beginning of the issue. I actually, I, I said earlier, you're eventually going to have this conversation where they're looking for these answers after you spend some money and, and you know, for a year or two, try to try to get something going based on those sort of ambiguous architectural concepts. Uh, I've, I had uh, I had one client, I'll never forget him. He said to me once after a year, uh, you know, uh, I know you said to me last year to get them to 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 give me what they wanted and, and to ask these questions, they wouldn't give me an answer. They threw budget money at me. They said to get going and I got going and I did all the architectural stuff. Now they're asking me the exact same questions that I wanted to ask them last year that they wouldn't answer for me. The exact same questions. So uh, again, I, I usually stop here and say, you know, this seems melodramatic, but over and over again for the last 10 years, this is the thing that would have made the difference is if you couldn't, and that doesn't mean you stop in your tracks dead if nobody can do this. It means let's stop until we can come up with a bunch of these things because, and usually two or three are plenty uh, in the real world. I've seen one be enough, but I usually two or three are, are good. 
Uh, we do a thing at Prophecy where we try to come up with two or three and prioritize them and get ratification and all that. It's called the business impact roadmap. But that's the idea. In the real world, two or three is usually plenty for the t accounting or financial horizon of most companies. Um, and what this means is if you can't do it, you try to stop until you can, you know, get, have those conversations. Because like I said, this is going to get you less work because not only we're only going to talk today about identifying these, but this, this then informs whatever data model you're going to use. You should only model for the stuff that's going to deliver these three things. Most MDM vendors now are multi-domain platforms. Prophecy is as well. Uh, they're model agnostic. So they only have to model uh, things from domains that are going to make a difference for whatever outputs you want. And they can always be uh, grown sort of picture concentric circles growing outward as you get bigger and bigger. But again, I, I really want to emphasize this is a good sort of milestone here. If you really have trouble doing this, if you can't have these conversations, and I'm going to try to help with how to have them uh, in a couple of slides uh, and how to measure them as well. But, uh, you know, again, really think this through because it, it might be a year later, it might be 18 months later, but you're going to have this issue. Uh, you want to be in front of it when it's still an idea and something that might be undertaken before. So it's something that costs a lot of money and time and resources. So this is one way to, to talk to the business. I came up with this a few years ago and just never had a chance to really write a paper on it. Uh, it is a quadrant. Uh, the horizontal axis is what I call the financial financial axis. Everything below it is the classic below the line accounting stuff. Everything above it is the classic above the line accounting stuff. So down down below is saving money, up above is making money. Uh, the thing that's sort of new for me is the vertical axis. And to the left of that are things we do now and that we're really not that good at. We're not accurate or efficient, but we do it, uh, whatever it is. Uh, maybe we use spreadsheets or pencil and paper or calculators, but we do it. And, you know, we get away with whatever it is that we're doing uh, in the real world. Um, on the right, or the interesting things, those are things we can't do at all. Uh, and maybe there are people that work for us that used to do these things at a competitor and wonder why we can't do them, or they just assume our data is so terrible that we're never going to be able to. Uh, so, you know, why, so why is this helpful? So I will speak as a former worst offender at this, so I'm allowed to say it. Um, most good IT people have some understanding of business problems to some degree or another. Uh, the issue is, and again, I was, I, was, I was one of the worst offenders I've ever seen at this early, early in doing all of this, uh, is IT people left to their own devices will generally feel that the safest thing they can do is to save money by fixing current things that are not optimal because we already have them. Everybody knows what's wrong with them. I know what's wrong with them. I know what technology will fix them. MDM is a big part of it. Uh, so I'm just gonna do that. Uh, that's perfectly fine and stuff that probably needs to be done and it should be done and it should be measured. Uh, but uh, you know, they're, they're not usually enough to make these things, to push these things into positive financial or operational territory. So what is, so what is it? What we want to do is go sort of this upper right, net new processes that make us money that we're not making now. The other quadrants are all important. This just happens to be the one that usually where MDM and data management and data governance pay off, where you can prove that, you know, something happened that was very good. It wouldn't have happened if we didn't do all of this stuff behind the scenes. Uh, you know, and the other, the issue really here, so why doesn't everybody do this out of the gate? Uh, to, to, to make a joke, that's because uh, people in IT have to meet new people to make this happen. They have to go out, find business partners, take them to lunch, find out what, they, what it is they really want uh, or what they're unhappy about, either because they don't have it, hopefully, or because they have it and they don't like it if they're really going to stick to the left side of the vertical there. So just a way to partition the thinking. And that upper right is so critical. You know, the, mo the, the most difficult conversations I had, I think, in my career as an analyst and even before that as an MDM program manager and architect was my business partners aren't going to talk to me like that. They just, they, they just want to get to retirement. They just want, they want me to leave them alone, actually. Um, you know, I've had business people look across tables at me and say, you know, you're going to be gone and I'm still going to be here. And, and they were pretty much right. But I was able to do some things before I left that they probably weren't too happy about in terms of disruption, if you will. Um, but that upper right is so important that if that's the conversation that's going on, uh, my response to that for people that were in trouble trying to get this stuff done was then go get some business consultants that have worked with your competitors and scare your business partners. Because 
uh, you know, we could never share it because of NDAs, but I have, I, I know people that are doing things that are going to put you out of business if, if, and when they're successful. And if you don't do something, uh, you're going to be in a world of hurt when they get, when they get to critical mass of what they're doing. So, you know, I can only do you a service by saying, you know, I can't tell you because I'm under NDA, but this is so critical that you should, instead of spending money on trying to do all this stuff, you'd bet you'd be better off spending some money uh, on someone telling you what other people are doing because you have no vision is, is the word I used to use. You're all strategy, but no vision. And you need to get some because it's again, very risky to, to pursue this any other way. Another trick, uh, if anybody's ever worked in HR or with HR or been measured by this, uh, there's this thing called the SMART goals. I, I won't go through all of them. Uh, and some of them apply to a lesser extent, but this is a way to think about your, your MDM initiatives and your data management initiatives. What is it, you, you know, what is it you want to do? Can you measure it? Uh, you know, better data quality, there are ways of measuring it, but they, you know, they don't work in terms of business value. Usually they're, they're quite technical. Is there a beginning, a middle and an end? You know, MDM is a program. It's a series of projects. Each of those projects has a beginning, a middle or, or an end, but the program, Probably doesn't. Uh, the The most successful people I've met that do this uh, in the recent in recent years uh, will tell you, you know, I've still got five domains left to go, but I've got I've got an operating model. Everybody trusts me. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get funding. I know I can deliver on the data I committed to. Uh, I've got a whole risk mitigation program. That's considered successful. They they don't think they're ever going to be finished, but they know why they're doing what they're doing. And that next thing that, that, that they want to do, they can tell you in business reason, in business terms, why they want to do it and what the benefits are going to be. So again, if you're not familiar with SMART goals, you know, Google it. It's, it's a good thing to apply to things like data management, just as a check, a sanity check that says, am I in the right place? Am I doing something that can't be measured? How will I prove that this fixed anything or enabled something for the first time? So, you know, people always ask, you know, how do I measure this? The, prefer the preferred way is obvious. Uh, and we strive for this at Prophecy in, in terms of helping people do this. And we've been pretty successful. I, I'm really kind of gratified by how many people step up to this uh, in terms of prospects and clients for us. Um, but there are people that, you know, view this as risky. You know, if I put a dollar value to it and we don't save or make that much, uh, you know, what's going to happen to me kind of thing? How will I look? What will happen to my job? I, I have to say that in the years I've been doing this, you know, I, I used to tell people, take one third of it. Do you think you can you definitely deliver one third of what we're talking about or one half? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, then say that. Don't say all of it, uh, because I believe you're going to deliver all of it. And no matter, you, you know, if you just get out of bed in the morning, you're going to deliver half. of it. So, uh, again, dollars is best. However, if you can't, you know, workflow metrics. Uh, are effective, you know, so throughput, rate of cu customer onboarding, uh, at mean time to introducing a new products to market, that kind of thing. I'm happy with that. Uh, if they can't be converted to dollars, that's that's not optimal, but uh, certainly that it will work. And uh, what what's key there is consistency, uh, which is another thing, the great thing that if you if you use an ROI model like ours or somebody else's, uh, you'll get a, a yardstick that you know not only can you compare this. Uh, to other things when you're trying to kick it off. But when someone comes along after you're in business for 18 months and says, I want to buy a CRM system and I need the MDM money to do it. Uh, and they say, we're going to make 15% more money if we do that. Uh, and, and I pick on CRM and ERP because those are the ones I see the most. But you have something to compare it to, to say, well, wait a second. We have something that everybody ratified that said, you know, the benefits of this were three times that. Are we giving up on that now? Uh, and, you know, you want to have a real discussion. In effect, what you're doing is replacing subjectivity. I just know this will be great for, for the business uh, with objectivity. Here's how great it'll be. And here's how long it's going to take. And here, here's what it's going to cost. Um, just a little sort of real life note there, operational versus analytical MDM. Analytical MDM has real benefits. And, and a lot of our prospects and clients start with that because it's less invasive to just populate a bunch of data warehouses and marts and other analytic platforms than it is to send data back to operational systems. At, at first, uh, that's often sort of the strategic goal in the second or third years to become operational, to, to integrate real time with CRM and ERP, prevent duplicates during entry and all of that good stuff. Uh, and trigger business events like, you know, the overextension of credit risk or fraud or whatever it might be. Um, those are easier to quantify. Of course, they're harder to implement. So, you know, th this is the plan of the earth. Anything that's, you know, really going to help you is going to be harder to do. Um, 
you know, analytical MDM, it's harder to prove. And I'm happy to have this discussion with anybody because I could be wrong. But um, analytics, the value of them, unless they're operationalized, which is sort of a hybrid here, uh, it's harder to say how valuable improving them is. Uh, if you're already sort of getting the right answer and you're able to act on it, uh, getting it from 80% accurate to 100%, uh, I've had people tell me I, I'm just not interested in that. But if you say, you know, I can stop you from um, extending credit risk where you shouldn't, uh, as soon as you implement this, as provided you've got a, a credit reporting service that you already subscribe to or are willing to, then that, then all of a sudden they're interested. Uh, of course, again, that takes longer to do, uh, but easier to quantify, right? So, you know, what do you, what do you do next? Where do you take all this? So, you know, go back to that benefits quadrant. Um, and there are a couple of other tools that people use. Uh, and get a framework to capture, categorize, and, ra and ratify. I'm really happy I italicized that. Business benefits for strategic management programs. So uh, typical candidates are you know, internal ROI methodologies and tools. Some companies, I've worked with some very, very big uh, enterprises, they have things you have to use. Uh, they're, not, they're not all that friendly to data management, but you, you, you have to do them. Uh, I've used other tools like Prophecies or, you know, Gartner has one uh, as well that I worked on uh, for a few years. Uh, we used to use those as preprocessors sometimes to a client's uh, mandated ROI methodologies and tools because they just didn't have the kind of metrics generators that worked for data. It was more of a, a, a throughput kind of thing, which, which we could eventually talk to, but we had to do sort of a data centric thing first. Consulting firms often do this. And again, software vendors like Prophecy, we do it as well. Uh, we use the Deloitte value map, which is public domain, by the way. We're not stealing it from Deloitte. Uh, I find it quite effective. And again, Gartner has a framework if you have a Gartner license that, that's very, very good as well. Um, and what, so I italicize the ratification step there because that's something that people, enterprises, often skip. Uh, they generate some document that says how well this is going to pay. Um, and uh, they don't get anybody to sign off and say, these are the right things we to, to shoot at, uh, to aim for, right? So uh, what we want, among other things, is that, uh, that sort of buffer against external events that these things provide. So they not only result in less work, but they give you that yardstick I referred to, that if somebody comes along, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody that wants to take your money and buy, buy a business application. It could be a merger or an acquisition. And someone says, you know, we're already doing this. Uh, we're going to shut you down. Well, you know, how much value is yours providing? How much did your tools cost? Uh, how far along are you? How difficult is it? Are you paying a lot in implementation services uh, compared to what we're paying? Uh, who's got more data? Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I've been through a few of those. And they're made much easier when you can immediately show up with this thing that says, you know, uh, a couple of these people have moved on internally or externally, and we're get, we're buying a company or we're getting bought. But you know, here's here's the thinking, and it still looks good to me. What does everybody else think? And at least you have a discussion, a set of discussion points, rather than uh, you know we don't like you and we don't like this vendor, so you know we're gonna we're gonna move on uh, and just absorb you, uh, which you know very often isn't the right thing to do. So again, you want to replace that subjectivity with objectivity. Look, you know, we all did this work. Everybody agreed that this was it. Most of these people are still around, not all of them. And, you know, we should discuss this. Uh, this is another sort of uh, thing. If, if you can do it, if you can't, you can't. But if you can, you should. Uh, larger things like, you know, I get this all the time. You know, we're doing an ERP re-engineering or consolidation project. Should we do MDM now? Uh, yes, because you're going to do most of the work anyway, and then you're going to let it decay if you don't um, put something in place to maintain the data quality. Uh, I've written articles and articles about that, about, you know, business apps don't get paid to manage data. Uh, CX and CRM, same thing. If you're doing a CRM, uh, replacing one, consolidating, doing one for the first time. If you've got some sort of one customer initiative or one enterprise initiative, these things usually get funded pretty easily. Uh, the idea there is instead of proving just the standalone value of what you're doing, you you have a little smaller scope there. You can prove the value that you're going to add in terms of not allowing further technical debt to accumulate after you go live with whatever the business app is, ERP, CRM, something else. Um, and the, again, you'll, you should have real numbers if you've actually done done this work in whatever way you choose to do it. 
again, this is the ratification step. Get business and IT stakeholder agreement that these priorities and these measurements are the valid ones. It uh, doesn't mean they can't be added to later, which we'll talk about next. But without broad-based ratification, the effectiveness of the framework is fundamentally compromised. Again, if you if you get bought or somebody decides they they need your your funding, uh, what, you know, if you lift this thing up, what you don't want is everybody saying, "Yeah, I think I remember that, but uh, I never really believed it, or I never really bought into it." And you know, these vendors are, ta are taking me out to lunch uh, and saying, "All I need to do is install it and get some data in there, and we'll be doing great." Uh, or I don't even have to put data in and I can just start using it and let people enter data manually as we move along, uh, as they adopt it, you know, you can short circuit those conversations and it's not about spinning and getting your way. It's that's probably the wrong answer. And you probably have the right one in terms of business value. Um, again, you reflected in tons of conversations I've had over the years where, you know, if we had just done the right thing three years ago, we'd be so much better off now. Well, there's a reason you didn't do it, and it's probably going to happen again uh, unless we change our approach. And again, treat the completed framework as a living document. Again, I've had people do this. I, I alluded to this at the, at the top of the session. Had people do this, and then you know they're on the right track, and you you, you don't see them for 18 months, um, and uh, you you get a chance to talk to them, and, and they're in trouble again. And you say, what happened? You know why? Why are you doing this now? Oh, 360 view with a customer. Wait a second. We had three business use cases. Everybody agreed that that would be success. Uh, you know, what happened? Well, you know, we got in, entranced by uh, integrating stuff on the IT side and it worked and, and we started the scope got bigger and bigger. And now it's a 360 view thing. And guess what? We're not going to deliver on time. Uh, so I need to go back to the well, and there's not a single business use case that's been enabled by this thing. The data looks better in the current ones. And they were really, the business was really psyched up about that in the beginning, but now they're starting to kind of have the same problems and they're not too happy with us. So again, that can be avoided by going back every few months or if something happens that says, I need to go look at this, uh, could be a management, as simple as a management change. If your executive sponsor changes, you should certainly be going back and looking at uh, whatever justification entities you put in place. So I hope this was helpful. We got a ton of questions. I, I'm going to uh, go down the list here. Um, how to, somebody asked how to how to come up with actual numbers uh, for the example. So that's a, actually a great question, and it leads to something I didn't say, and I probably should have. One of the biggest mistakes uh, enterprises organizations make when they do this is baseline whatever these metrics are before you do anything to them to improve them. That sounds obvious, but I've had tons and tons of terrible things happen on my watch where people improve things and couldn't prove how much better everybody knew it was better uh but they just couldn't say you know it was worth spending this much money because we don't really have any documentation for how bad it was before so trap your onboarding rates over time even if you have to get acquire some tools to do it uh, and there's some very good tools out there now to do that uh operational if you decide those are your your metrics operational productivity if you can quantify Costs of, you know, I come from a lot of financial services. Noncompliance is a good way to say how bad your analytics are. Um, Noncompliance with regulations. So, you know, th there are ways to come up with actual numbers. We have a whole team at Prophecy that does this. Uh, I'm sure others have it too. Um, they're quite, quite good at this. And they work with, with your business people and say, you know, why do you think that's a problem? What do you think it's costing? How can we get to a number? How, how can we trap that? How can we track it? Uh, before we make the improvements, which we know we can make. Um, and again, we've had things come up where uh, we find out the priorities are actually different than everybody always said they were. We, we worked at a large manufacturer who said, you know, my problem is really that my suppliers are duplicated and I can't really uh, get, any, get the discounts I should be getting from them. And it's really killing me. And we went through a process with them and we discovered that, yes, that was a problem, but they actually had a much bigger problem. This was a big manufacturer with uh, on-hand parts inventory. They just had tons and tons of factories with parts sitting in them that they just didn't need to hold on to for that long. And we literally changed the program sequence because of that. Uh, so again, it, it you have to work with the business to get numbers. You have to get baseline numbers. Uh, it's It can be difficult. Uh, there are people out there that can help. We, we help. There are consulting firms that help. Um, but they should be real and they should be agreed to, again, by the stakeholders that govern them. Uh, someone said, I think it's uh, focusing on use cases for justifying MDM, but does the total cost justify the limited use cases? 
Uh, I'm going to go back to something uh, on this slide. What I should have said, I hate to use buzzwords, but that business IT collaboration up on the top right there, uh, I had somebody attend a, a webinar I did who, point, who interrupted me and said, that's digital transformation. That's what that is. That's where it is. That's what it is. If you don't do MDM, and there's, I've done some writing on this. It's out there somewhere, either on our website or in, in some trades. You're not going to do digital transformation if you don't do MDM, unless you only have one CRM and it's completely clean and one ERP and it's completely clean. And I'm pretty confident in saying that nobody does based on what I've seen. You can come pretty close if you're very small, but if you do that successfully, you're going to grow to a size where that won't be possible anymore. Um, and you know, also down to, you know, there's another question similar, how do we justify something that helps everyone but that doesn't help anyone by a lot? Uh, so again, if, if it doesn't, if it helps everyone, it's helping them by some amount. And again, there's, you know, what if I do nothing? There's, there's the, the old PMO, uh, PMP thing, uh, PMI thing of, you know, what if we don't, what's the cost of doing nothing? That's another good exercise. I should actually put that on one of these slides. That, you know, there is a cost to that, uh, play out the, what, what's happening to your organization, the trends that are going on on the business side over the next three years. Uh, I've had two clients in my career who were able to prove, for example, that if they didn't consolidate their master data and leverage it as an asset, and that's a big buzzword, but it's the shortest way to say that. Uh, if they didn't do that, then every time they introduce a new product from six months on into the future, it would cost them money, no matter how much revenue that product generated because the fixed cost of adding that bit of technical debt in systems and whatever else they, they had to do that dealt with data in analytics was going to be more than they would make because they just repeated infrastructure over and over and over again to support data. Uh, and there's some of that was operational stuff too, but most of it was data. And I had two clients that were able to do that to say, look, we have to do this. There's no more economy to be had in just continuing to expand our IT footprint in support of expanding our product set or our lines of business or whatever it might be. So again, um, it has to help somebody buy a lot or in the aggregate, it should be a lot. Uh, or I'm gonna say something inflammatory, you probably shouldn't do it then uh, because it is it does take time. But what I, I, I say, you probably shouldn't do it in order to be provocative because what you should do is get, get help to do this because I've never seen it come out that it wasn't worth doing. Once you add up all the things now, there's a difference between that and getting someone to pay for it. And you know, here's sort of the bonus uh, answer. I believe that data governance organizations that are usually virtual, not, not always and not always totally, but that are virtual should have their own budget to pay for the things like this that no one person is gonna take out their wallet and see, see enough benefit to pay for. Uh, if you limit yourself to only being able to pay that way, and I understand why somebody would, uh, these things are going to be even more difficult to do for the reasons that, that were brought up in the question. Uh, so my, my big answer to that is put in a data governance organization owned by the business, supported by IT that, uh, you know, and I have templates for that that I use uh, that are sort of logical models for organizations for, to do governance that will actually um, have money to do this. And they can charge back. If it turns out it works out, they can charge back. If not, they can eat it. But again, you know, d there are ways to do this. It just, again, takes some shifting. And I don't want to trivialize that. Uh, how, how do companies measure the post-MDM benefits? Again, it's, it's operational and analytical metrics. Analytical is harder. You can do it. Uh, so for example, it's easier in financial services and maybe healthcare if you have regulatory requirements that you're better able to comp comply with and more efficiently able to comply with. Uh, those are pretty easy to quantify because of the fines that you pay if you don't do that. Uh, and I speak from experience on the financial services side. Um, there are many banks and other institutions that regularly pay fines as a cost of doing business uh, when they really don't need to. And you can pretty easily eliminate them with things like MDM. Um, so, you know, it is worth it to do it. Uh, I will say that uh, I've taken surveys in my career where the number of people that actually do it is very low. Uh, I I think maybe there's a, they, they don't want to spend the money even if they're successful to go back and prove it. Everybody knows, quote unquote. Um, I saw somebody at a gaming company. The best one I've ever seen is they actually did two time and motion studies pre and post implementation. 
uh, and were able to prove that every person sitting in their customer in their call center uh, was, you know, like 50% more efficient per day. Uh, the, I, those are very few and far between. I think I saw one other one that sort of approached that, but wasn't the same. Uh, so again, uh, you know, it, it should be done. I, I've only seen a few do it. I saw one do it unbelievably well. Um, and uh, that was great, but that, that's a very good question. It's a, it's a good one. Uh, it's kind of the dirty secret of the data management world. Almost no one goes back. Uh, and I, I really think even when people are successful, uh, it's kind of a self-serving answer, but the success is so evident uh, that they don't really want to spend the money to prove it. And you know that, that maybe that's okay. It's probably unfortunate. Um, if you are able to do it, uh, someone asked, you know, should we keep measuring and publicizing that? I think again, back to that governance organization. And if you're trying to do MDM and you're not putting a governance organization together, uh, you're going to have other issues, and some of them are going to be related to this. Uh, but it should be there, and it should be uh, related to the business. In fact, another sort of thing that's out of scope of this is while you're building this business case, those stakeholders you're talking to are probably the same ones you're going to want to say, I need somebody to be to run the governance council. I need somebody to be data stewards. And, you know, that it should be, happen in the same discussion. You know, they're talking about what the benefits are going to be. Uh, you want to have in some proximity sort of what you need back from them in terms of management and ongoing meeting and, and prioritizing changes that might need to be made or additions that are going to want to be brought in once you see how well this works. Uh, so again, I believe, I hate to say big governance, but I, I like this idea that this organization does other stuff besides adjudicates fights uh, between people arguing about what a customer is, which they do need to do. Uh, pretty early on, but I, I really believe in this idea of they have money, they prioritize stuff, uh, they don't pay for everything, but they pay for things sort of like the question stated where no one no one area or person sees enough benefit to pay. Um, and so again, take that concept away from you as well, with, with you as well. Uh, we have another question. Uh, how do you justify data management for AI programs? So I'll give you a long answer to this. Right before COVID hit, uh, I did a presentation, uh, interactive presentation for 60 CIOs in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and, you know, they were pretty much allowed to ask whatever they wanted. And one of the things they wanted, they were, that they said they were the most afraid of was the inability to do root cause analysis. And that was, in, so I'll tell you the way they said it to me, you know, this AI stuff, uh, and we do use some AI, like Prophecy, we use AI to do matching. Uh, we use some machine learning stuff. Uh, we don't publicize it too much because we've been doing it for a long time. And, you know, we, we just don't think it's that cool. But, um, you know, the other part of AI and data management is reversing the polarity. You know, how much, why is, why is, should we do DM if we're going to do AI? Well, all 60 of these guys, it was pretty much unanimous. They said, uh, you know, uh, I want to say it exactly the way they said it. If you're lucky, you'll get recommendations from your AI engine or your models that are patently ridiculous and that you can tell are wrong. If you're unlucky, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll you'll get uh, things that kind of look right, but they're not. And they end up being very costly and you could incur reputational risk or, or any number of things. Um, they were They were pretty much, they said, this is the thing that keeps me up at night is we're, lo we're loading up data lakes or swamps or lake houses, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and then we're loading that into these AI models and we're acting on the stuff that's coming out. And I have no idea if we're doing the right thing. And you know, I, we have data scientists, we ask them how to prove it to us and they always start with the same assumption that the data is trustworthy. And I'm pretty sure it's not is, is what they were saying. And you know, the good news is sometimes it says something that's so crazy, we stop. Other times we, we sort of get a bad feeling and we stop even though it looks right. The problem in both cases is it's, it's diff very, very, very difficult to virtually impossible to do the kind of root cause analysis you do on regular sort of rules engines and data quality and integration rules. So again, you know, it's, going back to some sort of risk analysis that says, you know, what if we don't do anything and we just start doing this stuff? Uh, what's happened to other people that might happen to us? 
Uh, you know, the, the problem with AI is, and it's a little bit of a cop out on my part, so I apologize. The problem is it's still, it's not new, but it's, it's broad-based attempted usage is relatively new. So the horror stories that people are willing to put out there and say, don't let this happen to you are very, very scarce. Uh, but I can tell you just being around these 60 people, it's really stuck with me almost to, to, you know, almost to a person in this crowd. Um, you know, everybody there. Uh, my response to them was, ladies and gentlemen, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, and I don't have a good answer for you other than to do MDM. I, we just, I, I don't think they're published yet, but I just wrote a couple of magazine articles on this topic uh, that say, you know, look, you're playing with fire and you're not even going to know where the fire is uh, or how to put it out. Uh, the only way to effectively fight it is to stop this stuff upstream, which is what MDM is designed to do conveniently for me. Uh, but that's, that's really the only way, uh, that's practical, you know, theoretically you could go up there and clean up everything, but if you don't put in some sort of technology that keeps it that way, it's immediately going to start to decay and you might be okay for two or three or four months, but then that technical debt builds back up because again, the things that are generating this data don't get paid to keep that data clean. And you can put some things in like, okay, the company name has to be at least two or three, uh, bytes, uh, but that's not going to do it because that's not going to stop you from creating duplicates, um, that kind of thing. And anybody here that manages CRM and ERP knows what I'm talking about. There's virtually nothing there. And, you know, all, up until recently, most of the, these vendors, and again, to their credit, they didn't even pretend to take care of that stuff. Now they're starting, they're, everybody says data is important. So they're starting to say some things that sound sort of good, but I haven't seen a lot of real execution. And even if they do it, it's only going to be within their universe, uh, regardless of what they say. Uh, they, they still almost never do a lot of work on how to integrate external things with their data models, for example, because their data models work for them as well they should. Uh, so again, uh, I, I can't offer a concrete suggestion other than that sort of zero-based risk analysis that says, okay, what if we don't do anything? What do we think we can accomplish? And what risks are involved there? What's, what could happen? Let's look and see what our, has any, anything happened? And again, the issue with that is there's not a lot of stuff out there like there is with data security. You can find security breach documentation everywhere on the internet, uh, historically going back years. You can't find that for AI yet because nobody really wants to put that out there. I think eventually they're going to have to, but they don't yet, to be perfectly blunt. And, I, and I, I wish I could be a little more helpful there. But I can describe the problem for you and the fact that, again, I was with 60 CIOs before we went on lockdown who all said they had this problem and were very, very afraid of it. So I think if you can make the argument that, look, the only way to fix this is to fix it up front so that we trust it 100% so that that's not part of the equation. If we see something funny downstream, we can assume it's a problem with the AI models, uh, whether it's ML or something else, and work on it from that standpoint. Uh, because if if it could still be the data, figuring out what data it is and what 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 was wrong with it or anomalous about it that caused this is almost impossible. And again, I'm going by what 60 people with boots on the ground told me all at once in unison, pretty much. So I, I hope that's helpful, kind of a downer. But uh, again, it's a legitimate point. Uh, that's the best way to do it today. I hope it gets easier as people are more open with things that have gone wrong, but I haven't seen a lot of that, unfortunately. About one minute left. Uh, any final questions or thoughts? Stump the panel. <laughs> <laughs> or they're trying to hear me talk, which could be. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you so much, Phil, for that wonderful presentation. No, thank you, guys. Um, and thanks for the great, great questions. Really good. Yeah, everyone good. is encouraged to continue uh, networking and chatting within the SpotMe app. Um, as well, when this video is posted, uh, probably by the end of the day, the Q&A will be live. So we can go in and keep chatting if you want to do that. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that our virtual exhibition booths are open until 1.30 p.m. Pacific today and tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.